All right. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Good? All right. Thanks for having me again. Uh, too bad it took you like two years to set up to recover from the last time, but uh, good job on, on making it back. Um, as Candy said, I'm, I'm Ian. Uh, I work, uh, I do security for a small e-commerce site, uh, but that's not related to what I'm going to present now, just putting it out there. Uh, and I'm going to talk about social media and how it relates to risk practice and security in organizations which is uh, an often overlooked aspect of managing security in an organization. Uh, but let's start with really understanding where the problem came from and kind of my journey into this, or our journey into this. This is a research that I've done with uh, uh, one of my research partners, Alex Hutton, uh, which knows a thing or two about uh, risk metrics. Um, so let, let's take a quick journey down uh, what's the problem. Anyone can spot the problem with one of those social media accounts. Is this Richard Branson's Twitter? Is that the, the real Oreo cookies uh, uh, Facebook page? And who the hell is Brian Myob? Myob doesn't sound like a familiar last name. These are all obviously, well, obviously to us maybe, fake accounts. Uh, if you notice, Branson's got an extra S in the Twitter handle. Uh, and these are very often uh, uh, very popular accounts on social media. Uh, they claim to represent someone that's not actually that someone and could potentially and often actually do cause harm in terms of public relationships or phishing or any, uh, any kind of social related attack uh, or attack vector that we know of. Uh, Brian Mile, by the way, is an actual good friend of mine who doesn't want to be you know, on social media under his own name. And Mayo, by the way, stands for mind your own business. Uh, if you look for that last name on, on Facebook, you'll see a lot of Mayobs out there. Another one, which one of those is me? All of them, one of them, none of them? That's a question that we often run into when looking at or looking for someone on social media. By the way, these are all my accounts that I use for different purposes. Uh, I have a different, you know, a, a, a specific purpose account for each one of my activities online. Uh, so that's kind of the basic motivations around why did we even start looking at it. And when we dove deeper into the problem, we realized that a lot of the attack vectors are actually shifting from email towards social media. It's much more interactive. Email is very asynchronous. You send and you hope that someone's going to read it. Um, social media presents an inherent trust in that social media network. Uh, if I see a friend of mine or a friend or a friend of mine, there's an implied trust that that person is somehow related to me. And if I have some kind of interactions with them, I carry that inherent trust and, and apply it to that person. And it's, uh, it's, very, it's pretty apparent, even when we're looking at DBIR statistics from a, a year ago. Uh, I haven't incorporated the latest one here, but the numbers actually grow in terms of the impact that we're seeing social media having in, as far as attack vectors and uh, injection vector, insertion vectors uh, into fraud and data loss in general. Uh, so why, why do I really want to deal with social media and, and how, how real is that impact? Uh, here's a quick couple of examples. Anyone recognize this uh, nice young lady? No one? I know it's a tough crowd because you're not Americans, but uh, uh, just, this is Justine Sacco. Rings a bell? Oh, okay, I see some nods. Uh, yeah, there you go. Uh, used to be very internet famous for all the wrong reasons. Uh, she used to work for an ad agency in, uh, in New York, I believe, and uh, she was about to board a plane to South Africa. And this is the tweet that, uh, that she sent out just minutes before boarding that plane. She tweeted at, boarded the plane, shut her phone down, and didn't really know what's going to happen. Uh, she had a couple of hundred followers, very small network uh, when, when she took off. Uh, but during her flight, 
that thing took off as well uh, and became an internet sens sensation. People were talking about her, uh, um, were, you know, saying bad things about her. Again, I'm not judging. You can judge. I, I usually judge, but I'm not judging this. It might be a misplaced tweet, you know, some, some improper sarcasm, but whatever it is, her workplace was mentioned as well as part of the, the online frenzy that started around her. Um, there is a, a, a trending hashtag, has Justine landed yet, on Twitter, that became, you know, number one uh, trending hashtag, and someone actually took a picture of her when she landed as she was checking her phone, which literally blew up with notifications uh, about that misplaced tweet. Shortly after that, she was fired. She was actually fired before she landed. So <laughs> uh, one of those notifications on her phone was, oh, by the way, you're fired, um, as she was just trying to get to uh, realization with what was going on. And this is her account of her experience after this. Uh, she got personal threats, death threats, uh, threats to her family, to her physical well-being, and all based on one little tweet. So yes, social media has some impact in terms of risk and security. Uh, and obviously, the company that she worked for had to deal with that PR nightmare of someone, someone that represented them either implicitly or explicitly doing something like that online. So this is one reason why we, we want to deal with that vector, uh, the social media one. Here's a, another example, and again, it's, it's fairly Americanized, but uh, again, you, you might recognize this, this smug little uh, person. Uh, anyone? Yes. All right. We'll see. All right. You're up to speed with, with what's going on. This is Martin Shkreli. Um, trust fund kid, loads of money, and not, you know, the elevator doesn't go out all the way up to the top floor, apparently, and he bought a pharmaceutical company, and his first decision as the owner of that company, which produces a, a, an AIDS-treating drug, was to uh, multiply the price of that drug tenfold. Smart decision from a business perspective, a uh, pretty bad decision from a PR perspective. Uh, that's the first thing you do when you buy a pharmaceutical company. Uh, and he was pretty adamant about defending his position and very, very vocal on social media, which obviously brought in the, the threats and uh, the trolling. Uh, and this is uh, 4chan talking about basically doxing him, doxing everything about him, his personal address, his business address, um, and, you know, it, it can range from ordering 10 trays of pizza to his house to throwing a grenade uh, into his, his open window. And he got a lot of personal, physical threats. He had to beef up his security. He started hiring security people, both physical as well as cyber security guys. Um, and again, you can clearly correlate his activities on social media with the security and the risk posture that he presented to himself as well as to his entire portfolio of companies. Last reason I want to deal with social media is some of us, not all of us, are affiliated with a controversial practice or an industry. Uh, by show of hands, which, who, which one of you is associated with one of those industries? Defense industrial base, yeah, yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Healthcare, finance, pharmaceuticals. All right, so everyone. The bottom line is that we're all dealing with something controversial to someone, to someone that has an interest in doxing, attacking, DDoSing, injecting, injecting malware, whatever it is, to our employees. So it's not that controversial if everything is controversial, which we know that uh, everything is. And so that was our kind of reasoning. Uh, and we realized that there's a gap. We, we couldn't find anything that could help us measure the risk of Martin Shkreli uh, or Justine Sacco 
or one of you guys checking into Area 41 uh, and talking about seeing security presentations or being associated with someone from a controversial country like myself. <laughs> um, so what's, what's that risk? And we had to come up with a solution. Uh, and instead of trying to build a product and pitch it and sell it and, and pimp it all over the place, we decided to create a framework. A framework that's going to be flexible enough, open, free, so that you guys can take it, criticize it, uh, adopt it, modify it to your needs, and see how, you ca how can you apply the social media aspect into your daily risk management and, and security posture for your companies. And we decided that that solution, that framework, should, provi should provide some basic capabilities. First and foremost, the ability to rate people one against each other. So if I'm looking at my IT department, not everyone is created equal, not everyone has the same online presence and activities, I need to be able to say this person is riskier than that person by how much. So I need to create some kind of rating mechanism that's not just going to bucket everyone that's on social media as risky, but provide some kind of weighing and, and rating between them. We also need to provide a root cause analysis. What is, what is it that makes you riskier than you? Are you trolling online? Are you attracting some kind of a, a bad press or, or unwanted attention from, from individuals or groups that my company is concerned about? We wanted to be able to consistently track this activity and that rating over time in order to be able to reduce the risk. So after rating and identifying the root cause, we want to be able to apply controls or activities to reduce that risk and measure that level of reduction so we can see whether we're effective or not. And last but not least, we wanted to be able to augment our OSINT capabilities in terms of collecting information that's freely available online and how it reflects on us as a company, as an organization, as individuals. And so the next, so we have this grand idea of, of dealing with social media and creating a framework. Uh, and the next question that we faced is how feasible is this? We're talking about something that's very intangible, that's very hard to measure. We're talking about people's online activities and what they say and in what context they say it. And we start looking, has anyone done any work? Because the last thing we want to do is, is reinvent the wheel. Uh, and we actually found that it is possible, that we found indicators that this is something that's been done before in terms of semantic analysis and predicting risk and activities based on people's online behavior. And the study that we found is a sentiment analysis on the German, German elections a few years ago that basically took everything that the candidates expressed online and measured it in terms of how the public reacted or, or predicted how the public would react based on basic characteristics in terms of uh, past orientation, positive emotions, neg negative emotions, and really providing that kind of uh, dive in, into the context and the meaning of what they were expressing online. So this study is available on this link, uh, you, can, you can freely download it and uh, kind of see how that fares up and how it can be used uh, in analyzing content online. So in order to create a framework, uh, you, don't just, you don't just start with an Excel sheet and it's like, all right, let's plug some numbers. Uh, you have to have a cohesive methodology. And one of the people that uh, Alex pointed me to is Victor Basile which uh, has this idea about a GQM, Goal Question Metrics, uh, which is a, a framework for creating frameworks. I know it's kind of uh, uh, cyclical, but it actually works. It makes you think in a very specific way uh, and forces you some structure and, uh, um, and, and forces you to apply knowledge to the right directions. The idea is very simple. You define goals. What, what are you trying to accomplish? Uh, for each goal, you start asking questions. What is it that's going to make me understand how to meet that goal? Okay, how do I address the context of that specific goal? And for every question, identify what kind of metrics do I need to collect in order to answer 
those questions. So it's a very systematic way of looking at a problem. A, a quick example for applying GQM to patch management would look something like this. Uh, I need to create a patching scoreboard. Uh, the three, my three goals are comprehensiveness, timeliness, and cost, effect, uh, cost effectiveness. I'm going to quickly dive through this. This is not, you know, uh, uh, this is just an example. If I'm looking at comprehensive, what are the questions that I need to answer? Well, I want to see what's the coverage by risk. I want to see what is the coverage by asset category uh, and look at the different metrics that would help me measure the answer to, that, to those questions. Same goes for timeliness. What's the policy? What are other considerations for timeliness? What are the priorities for timeliness? And again, look at the metrics that provide, quest provide the answer for the questions. And same goes for cost efficiency. So when we started applying GQN for SMIRM, which is the current name for social media risk metrics, <laughs> and someone came up with a better name on Twitter. I haven't updated it here yet, but uh, feel free to suggest uh, better, better terminology. The main goal is really to provide a social media risk scorecard for a person as well as an organization. Uh, and we made that specific distinction because organizations, specifically uh, uh, corporate accounts and an aggregation of multiple individual accounts behave differently than individuals and need to be addressed differently from a control perspective. Uh, the questions that we're trying to answer uh, in order to, to hone in on that goal is how does one's online activity affect the likelihood of a threat, uh, the impact of it, the areas of impact, uh, and how does unsanctioned presence, stuff that I'm not responsible for, affect my risk or my uh, implied risk to my organization? We had a, a few more goals. Uh, oh, and the metrics of callers uh, were qualitative with a pinch of quantitative. Uh, we kind of botched things up a little bit, but I'll talk about that in, in a few minutes in, in terms of how we balance the quality and the quantity of, of uh, applying metrics to those questions, to answer those questions. A few more goals uh, just to kind of uh, round up the, uh, the idea behind the framework that we came up with is creating a scorecard for executives, uh, looking at other quantitative, uh, quantitative uh, um, uh, measures of working with uh, third parties. So when I'm engaging with a third party and I have a, a selection of a few, this could be another, another way to choose between them. Is one third party riskier because of their online behavior versus a different third party? That might shift my view in terms of choosing who to work with. Um, again, look for quali quantita quantitative ways um, to rate employees and to apply different controls and activities around them, and so on and so forth. Again, you, you can read. I don't need to, to help you with that. And this is what we came up with. We came up with a big uh, mind map that put all those ideas together, uh, put the structure behind GQM into this, uh, into this uh, uh, framework and expressed it in a, in a fairly simplified way. And from that mind map, we ended up with the full framework. Uh, so let me walk you through uh, some of the key elements here. And again, I'm not going to go through each and every one of the metrics, just to give you an idea, uh, because this is all free and available online. You can do a deep dive uh, for yourself later on, and we'll see some examples. So let's dive through some of those uh, kind of key elements. What makes an individual risky? Um, there are a few elements that we, we looked at in terms of how does one's online activity uh, um, increase the, the motivation or the likelihood of someone attacking me or targeting me. Uh, so we're looking at, at a few characteristical behaviors like uh, am I enticing hacktivism? Am I talking about controversial topics related to, to hacktivism. Politics is a very popular way to attract unwanted attention. Fortunately for us, uh, for, for those who live in the US, and probably even more fortunately for you guys who don't live in the US, the, the current political situation in the US provides a lot of 
opportunities <laughs> for, uh, for attracting attention. Uh, you just need to say that you like one candidate and automatically half of the population is against you. Uh, and that can end up in, again, in physical harm or, uh, or actual threats as we can all hear from the media. Religion, another topic that's not controversial at all, right? Everyone likes religion. Um, especially because my religion is better than yours and I should kill you because you're not in my religion. Not controversial at all. And especially for someone who speaks very vocally online about religious things and that might attract, you know, the other religions to react to him. Sports, you'd be surprised how fanatic people can get about defending or attacking a specific sports team. Uh, especially around certain times of the year. You can actually map it out on a calendar and say, this is going to be a hot zone for football, soccer, baseball, cricket, whatever it is. People get pretty crazed up at, about it. Uh, don't quote me, I'm, I have zero interest in sports and I had to actually look into this from a researcher's <laughs> perspective, but uh, it's a big thing apparently. Fraud. Am I inviting people uh, by saying that, oh, I found a way to manipulate a stock of some sort, or I find a way to game a system in a way that's going to be uh, uh, very beneficial to me financially, uh, or I found a way to get information, insider information on my company that might help someone trade better or trade against my company uh, in a fraudulent way. Again, a very, uh, a very interesting topic, and you can see a lot of people looking for those kind of hints and tips and tricks uh, from, a, from a fraudulent perspective, from a hacked, uh, hacker perspective, to, to, gain financial, to have financial gain. And last but not least, uh, spying. Everyone is a target, especially if you're dealing with a controversial uh, industry, especially if you're dealing with sensitive information, that might have national security implications. Uh, if you work for energy, if you work for healthcare, uh, defense contractors, and so on and so forth, your adversaries are not just competitors, it's also other nation states. And they're gonna look for activities by your employees that might help them target that organization to get more information. The next uh, element we wanna look at is how do the threats express themselves? So we need to measure, is that threat going to be cyber? Is it a physical thing? Am I talking about physical facilities that might entice someone to, to break into them? Uh, or is it purely social? So we kind of categorize those into different, uh, different buckets so we can associate the, uh, the means or the attack vectors into a specific uh, avenue and we can measure that differently. Um, the next element, the, the, kind of the second batch, focusing on measuring the potential impact. So two main areas for potential impact. First, financial. Okay, if I'm talking about fraud, usually the impact is going to be financial in some sort. If I'm talking about uh, my root access to servers, the impact might be a little more technical. And these are the two main buckets that we, uh, that we used for categorizing uh, uh, the type of impact of a potential threat based on your online activities. And we'll see how it all ties up together. <clears throat> last, but the, the last two branches is looking at unsanctioned activities. Stuff that I didn't put out online, but exists online and is related to me. Uh, first example is impersonators. Is someone trying to impersonate me online? I know for sure that there are a few impersonators for me uh, on LinkedIn, on Twitter, on Facebook. Uh, so I have to take that into account and know how to deal with that. Um, another example is uh, uh, parody accounts. This is not an impersonation per se, because they say I am not the real Donald Trump, but this is a parody account. What kind of what kind of traction does that have? What kind of impact that does have on my risk po posture? Maybe a lot, maybe not so much with 30,000 followers and by now it's, it's, a, it's a, a, a lot more than that. This was taken 
Um, when Trump was kind of a joke running for president, and now it's, oh my God, this is real. Uh, so that account has got way more followers now. With those followers, they have the impact of changing public perception and having, having a say that actually uh, it carries to something. And last but not least is just information leaks. Someone doxing you, someone putting out information on you, whether it's true or not, if it's online, it must be true, right? Um, and how does that impact that organization in terms of data that's out there and actually is relevant or data that's not relevant and might, and might entice someone to dig in deeper because, oh my God, they were breached and all those, look at all those passwords and DNS entries and IP addresses and whatever it is, let's try to bang on and see if we can get in. That actually does entice someone uh, and can increase the likelihood of someone attacking you or at least probing a little bit. Um, so this is what we ended up with. This is kind of the, the unfolded, uh, the complete spread out tree of the social media risk metrics. Don't try to read it, I'm just bragging. It's big, it's, it's uh, comprehensive. Um, and we included a lot of different metrics in there, folded them into uh, ways to answer those four main questions that we had and ended up with a score um, because we needed to come up with something that was, uh, that had a number associated with it. Um, and it was, it was kind of tricky. How do you measure uh, the level in terms of if, if I see something bad about you, how bad is it? Is there a way to measure the level of badness uh, in terms of you know, hate speech, political speech, hacktivism, and so on and so forth, all the examples that we talked about. And this is where we came up to, to some of the challenges between quantitative and qualitative. What we ended up doing is uh, taking a, a fairly qualitative approach. Uh, all those uh, branches, all those leaves that you, see, that you saw on the, the, the mind map ended up being scored with a binary value exists or doesn't exist, basically flip toggles. Do we see that activity? Yes, no, yes, no, 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 yes, yes, yes. Kind of flip through those switches. Don't care about the level. Only care about if I see that kind of activity associated with your online presence. Um, now, we ended up with a lot of ones and zeros, and now we had to weight them to see how they actually affect or how they compose a risk score that would be a little more uh, quantifiable. Um, and we solved that challenge by, first of all, looking at weighing. Because if I look at a small company uh, versus a big company or two companies that deal with different industries, they would have different biases. One would be much more sensitive to political speech maybe because they're associated with a certain political party. Another one might be, a, might be much more concerned about hacktivism because they're Greenpeace. So politics and hacktivism would have completely different weights for those two organizations. There's no way for us to come up with a, you know, with, with a finite number that says this is your risk. That would be insane. So we cheated our way a little bit and the first step when you use the framework is to put in your biases. Uh, and we had a simple mechanism of providing you with you know, a number of points to distribute between the different categories. And you're basically entering your specific organization's sensitivities or biases into the system. Using that weighing, which you can see here on the right, we ended up with a way to translate ones and zeros into much, something much more scalar uh, and linear instead of just binary. Uh, and that's how we ended up with, with the final score. So instead of just averaging the number of ones and zeros, we had better weighing to them that reflected my organization's specific biases and sensitivities into a final score. And the, the current status of the scorecard takes those four elements, all right? The likelihood, manifestation, the impact, and some funky number that we call the, the aggregate number of online threats or, or kind of factored number of online threats that reflected your 
specific risk level online. Uh, so this is the current status. In future developments, we intend to multiply that and apply to both personal and corporate aspects, uh, and furthermore, factor in additional metrics and additional questions like, what is my exposure to malicious content based on what, based on my network of friends, based on what my friends, what, what my network is posting? Um, what is specifically the negative sentiment that I'm attracting or that's being uh, applied to me as a person? Is someone saying, oh, Ian's an idiot, who gave him, you know, the spot on Area 41? I'm still trying to figure that out. Uh, <laughs> and what kind of information leaks exist? And quantify and measure them and see how those apply uh, more accurately to my risk posture. So you're probably asking what kind of data do I need to provide that, that risk scoring? Uh, so some basic elements about the organization to put me in context. First of all, the size of the organization. If I'm measuring me uh, in my previous workplace, which had about 100 people, I have you know, a fairly big impact on the organization. Uh, if you measure me against my current organization, which has a few hundreds of thousands of people, my impact is slightly smaller. Um, geography goes a long way. What, where is my organization operating? What offices do we have? Uh, how many assets am I monitoring? Am I monitoring just me? Uh, am I monitoring 20 people in the organization? Again, 20 out of 100, that's a pretty decent uh, measurement base. 20 out of 200,000, mm, not so much. So I need to factor that in. Uh, I'm measuring the chatter. How many instances of, uh, of chatter do I see online that reflect on me? How many impersonations that I've discussed before? And what kind of sentiment uh, is being expressed about me? And we'll talk about how to measure sentiment in, in a few minutes. Uh, so that's the basic information. And the way that you can start using this framework to apply it to your risk posture is a, I believe it's a nine step process, but we'll, we'll see, I can't remember. Step one is understanding what is your organization's um, willingness to even start looking at people's personal online activities. And you will see all of the range from nothing, we cannot look at, at what people are doing online and actually measure it and, uh, and use that as something to, uh, to tune or, uh, or to act upon from a security posture, from an organizational posture, all the way up the scale to enforced. We will not only look from an open source perspective, open source intelligence perspective, but we will force people to provide us access to their accounts because they might be tweeting from protected accounts. They might be limiting the, uh, uh, the publicity of their Facebook posts to friends only. And I wanna know exactly what they're doing. So you'll see that entire range. The key is to identify where is my organization on that scale so I can start adapting and, and work towards uh, the right way to do this. Obviously, when you're doing nothing at all, you kind of at an impasse, uh, so you need to figure out a way to convince the organization to say, look, this is out there, okay? The way that we're gonna use this is from an outsider perspective, we're not gonna hack into anyone's account, we're not monitoring people's private communications, let's just factor in OSINT, and that usually is, is something that's fairly acceptable from uh, even very sensitive organizations. Step two is identify who do I want to track. Especially with large organizations, you can't track everyone. I mean, you can, if, if you can, that's great. But you usually wanna focus on key individuals. Uh, and that focus would usually range between uh, four different categories. First is IT. All right, they have access to sensitive systems. Um, and if I own an IT guy, let's say uh, someone with, who's an admin at uh, some Italian company that deals with uh, shady uh, malware, that's one way to get into the organization and apparently it's a, it's a successful way. <coughs> Sorry. Do I look at executives and board members? They have a lot of impact on the organization. If I target them, 
I can leverage that and either own them or, uh, or force some kind of sentiment from them that would have an impact on the organization or use them to get, you know, to tell the IT guy, hey, I need access to this, this, and that. Marketing and PR, that's their job. They're designed to go out there and be vocal and engage with, with a, a large audience. By definition, they're exposed to a lot of that audience's uh, replies, and they have a lot of friction with the outside world. And last but not least, salespeople. They're <laughs> the classic target. They're out there, they're trying to pitch everything. They'll sell their sister for a big sale, right? Uh, so they're going to be very engaged on social media. Uh, they're going to be very interactive if you approach them, especially on LinkedIn when you're like, hey, I need to buy something. I was like, oh, no problem. <laughs> Let's go out for a beer. Awesome. Um, so step two is, again, targeting or identifying who are our focal points inside the organization to start tracking. Step three, start collecting information. Um, where? The internet. Everywhere. Uh, I'm not kidding. And if you need some help, there are books out there to help you figure out how to collect information um, by Google hacking, by scraping, by looking at data that's freely available that is not closed in terms of uh, accounts or protections or even then, uh, and try to collect as much data as you can about that organization. Step four is taking all of that mass of data that you've collected, taking that internet and folding it into something that you can comprehend and use and analyze. That's called ETL, uh, extract, transform, and load. Uh, and in our specific example, it's more of a scrape transforming load. It's taking a tweet, breaking it down to entities that we can work with uh, by using some form of scraping, and ending up with the raw data that we can feed back into a machine, into storage, so we can reference uh, the different elements, like links, like uh, entities, uh, and so on and so forth, so we can relate to them and understand and kind of create a social graph of the threats or, or the activities that we want to track. Uh, talking about storage, we need to store stuff. Uh, storage nowadays is easy. As, uh, as Marcus says, big data, big data, big data. Um, I'm not going to talk about it because go to RSA and figure it out. Step six, analyze. So we have all that information stored in big data. We need to analyze it now. Uh, two major approaches for data analysis. One. Automation. Automate as much as you can. You'll hit a wall in automation. You'll hit a wall where you would need some kind of subject matter expert to say, this is right, this is wrong, or let's do some more folding and kind of a, a manipulation. That's when we get to the kind of Amish handcrafted model of looking at data and starting to, to make those correlations by hand so we can feed back into automation. There is no right or wrong here. You have to apply both. Uh, and your goal would be to use Amish handcrafted analysis uh, in a way that would feed back into automation so you can move on to the next target and the next target and kind of uh, uh, get from that 80-20 to 90-10 all the way down to the 2% that you need to deal with manually versus 98% that's, that's being automated in terms of analyzing this. A quick example about using semantic analysis, especially when we're talking about automating the way to, uh, to extract context from text, um, is uh, in, in an automated fashion. And again, this is going to be very subjective. But the key here, and that's the, the, the tricky part, it doesn't have to be completely right because it's subjective. So it doesn't have to be right, it just has to be consistent. So if I feed the same text twice, it has to give me the same results. If I feed the same text with some uh, uh, um, verbal differences, but the same meaning, I still have to get the same results. So that's what, I mean, uh, uh, that's what I mean when I say it doesn't have to be right, it has to be consistent. And one of those systems is, uh, was actually built by IBM's Watson Laboratory. Uh, and they can actually, they provide you with an automated way to analyze, semantically analyze text. Um, so I fed 
a big blob of text. Uh, in this example, Donald, Tr uh, Donald Trump's uh, speech when he announced that he's running for president. It's a long piece of text, uh, and it's got a lot of semantics and content, uh, as you'll see in a second. And this is the breakdown that I got from the machine. Again, don't judge, not right or wrong. This is very subjective. Uh, we're sensing 98% anger, 88% uh, negativity out of the 42% emotional tone of that speech. And I can even get a further breakdown of very particular elements of openness, consciousness, all the way down to, to very minute details of how that person is expressing in itself, themselves online in a kind of a, a verbal analysis of, of the aggregation of all those different elements. You're social, boisterous, and can be perceived as short-sighted. Again, don't judge me. This is what the machine came up with. <laughs> um, Donald Trump is just a great example because he's, got, he's, he's very vocal, uh, he's very emotional, which carries pretty well in his, in his, uh, in his text. Um, and there's a lot of data to work with. So again, it's, it's a great uh, research target uh, to use. And then you just apply, you know, step 6.B uh, is apply some big data magic to transform all of that, to aggregate it, and to come up with a score. Uh, and that score is basically what we have in the framework uh, where we talked about the weighing of the different elements. Uh, that's the result of flipping those toggles that are based on everything that we talked so far, semantic analysis and so on and so forth. So, Here's a quick example of how that looks like. Demo, demo, work with me. Oh, you can go away. Uh, you can go away, yes, all right. So this is our infamous social media risk metrics framework. Uh, it's basically a five tab Excel sheet available on Google Docs. Uh, do I need to make it bigger, bigger? Is this good? Can you see it in the back? Sure. Bigger. That's what she said. Um, <laughs> first tab is just a breakdown of the, the goals that uh, we talked about before. Second tab, you already saw. This is the first step when you enter into the matrix, uh, is to enter your biases. So we can weigh that, uh, and again, this is for Donald Trump's organization, uh, the different biases. We're c we care a lot about financial and stock, not so much about technology, IP, and so on and so forth. So this is, uh, again, this is a sample. It doesn't have to be right or wrong. It's consistent, and you can, you can fine tune it. These are some of the tracked parameters that I talked about initially in, in terms of step two. What, what do I collect? Uh, so some numbers that we plugged in for organization size, management location, chatter, a number of tracked entities. And finally, we get the formula. This is where we flip the toggles. So I'm just looking at the yellow highlighted elements, and I basically flip. You know, if I see a, any kind of online activity related to economics, I flip the toggle. If I do social, that probably needs to be flipped as well. And so on and so forth. So I just flip the toggles in terms of a, <coughs> Excuse me, what kind of threats am I motivating? And I basically go down that tree, that big mind map tree that I've uh, shown before, and I flip all those toggles, and you can see the numbers starting to form up in the green boxes in terms of the calculation. And once I'm done with this, once I'm done with the collection and analysis and flipping the toggles, I can look at my final scorecard, which is now an expression of those four main elements that I talked about, likelihood, manifestation, impact, and the factor number of online threats. Uh, and this is what I get for uh, analyzing a specific person. And then I go on to the next one, to the next one, to the next one, and I have those four numbers that represent that person's online social media risk sc score in terms of what do I need to do now. Uh, and if someone is riskier than someone else, and I define a certain level, a threshold of, I can live with this kind of risk, but nothing above that, I can look at that person and say, well, the mo manifestation here is too high. And I can go back to the previous sheet and understand and drill down what caused 
manifestation to be such, so high, that, that 5.2. I wanted to lower that to like, I don't know, a 4.8 to a 5.0. And I can look at the elements that triggered manifestation and see what, what is it that caused it to be so high. So I can see all those ones here and I can now address them. I can figure out, do I need to apply, you know, technology controls? Do I need to sit down with a person and it's like, dude, you can't say that online. <laughs> uh, which are all valid responses and activities in order to reduce that risk. And a month after that, I can measure again, or a day, or a week, whatever it is, and see how that score changed. And if I'm being effective in terms of fixing the problem or reducing that risk. Let's get back to our presentation. That's what I love about Excel demos. They can't really screw up, unless it's on Google Docs and then I have to connect and you're all attacking me. Uh, so where, where can you get it? Well, two places. Uh, first place is the Society of Information Risk uh, Analysts. There is a secret society of information risk analysts. Uh, it's like a special handshake and you have to like, bring the blood of uh, someone that you sacrifice, but uh, it's, it's, it's there and they actually uh, published it as part of their activities, mostly because of Alex and he's on that uh, secret society. And the second site is surprisingly riskmetrics.com was not registered. It is now and that's where you can get uh, all the data, uh, the Excel sheet, the mind map, and a full documentation of what each and every metric that we're talking about means and how how, how do we collect it? How do we apply it? And in what cases should we flip it up or down? So that's where it's all at. Uh, feel free to comment, to take it, use it, abuse it. You don't have to tell me. Do whatever you want with it. If you, if you contribute back, that's great. Uh, if you used it and it's shit, don't tell me. If you use it and it's phenomenal, uh, post it online so I can brag. Um, so quick takeaways and, I'll, and we'll, we'll sum this up. First of all, before you even start engaging in all this fancy big data analysis stuff, is try to figure out if you do have a social media policy. Do you even, do your organization, does your organization even care? Uh, and what kind of framework do you have, or what kind of boundaries did the organization paint in terms of what you're allowed or not allowed to do, so you can have at least a baseline of this is good, this is bad, or, or this is what we can do. Uh, if you don't have one, you probably want to create something before you dive in and start telling people, stop saying shit online. Um, try to understand if you have a risk model beyond let's run Nessus and see what vulnerabilities do we have. That's not a risk model. Uh, try to see if you have a risk model for your security posture that takes into account something more than just vulnerability scanning. Uh, and see how that fits into the risk model. Again, you need to make this work inside your existing model. There is no way you can change that. If you're using one framework or another framework, there is no way you can shift just because, oh, I want to factor in risk uh, on social media. Find a way to transform the scoring from here into your risk model and apply it the right weighing and pressure uh, um, so, you can fit, so you can use that model. Measure your current, once you have that done, do a test run, do a baseline. Run this exercise on a few key accounts um, just based on open source intelligence and get a baseline of measurement. And then do another baseline after a month, after a couple of months to see what changed and to see if that model really reflects the changes in the sentiment, the changes in the expressions, the changes in the activities that people have. And then you can see where you can actually apply controls and activities and education to lower that risk. And that's going to become your ongoing practice in terms of measure, measure the gap, measure again, see if there's a gap. And every time there's a gap, identify the right components that contributed to that gap so you can address them at the right level, whether it's HR, whether it's technical, whether it's legal, marketing, and so on and so forth. Make sense? Perfect. This is all I have for you. We're good on time. Ah, oh, perfect. Of course. Um, any questions? Do we have a minute? Yes. 
We have about a minute for questions. Wow. All right. All right. So it's all clear. That's phenomenal. <laughs> well, I'll be around here. Um, buy me a drink. I'll, I'll answer. I'll spill out everything. So uh, for the next two days. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you.